I'm George Liston, CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. We often hear that the past is prologue whenever there is a wish to link future probability to past performance. So when we think about the prospects for democratization in the Middle East, we're well advised to see what precedent, if any, exists for such an outcome. Now, happily, there is a rich, if little-known, era of substantial Arab involvement with the philosophy and practice of liberal democracy. And if modern democracy does take root in the Middle East, this history may prove a rich resource indeed. Once again, the path to the future may wind through the mystic realms of the past. My guest is Saad Eddin Ibrahim, chairman of the board of the Ibn Khaldun Center for Development in Cairo, and a current fellow of the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars. So I'd welcome to Dialogue. It's a pleasure to be here, George. It's Thank a pleasure you. to have you back. It's an honor to have you back. Let me say Thank that. You. Like so many of your, your many, many friends here in, uh, in this area. And with your help, we're going to look both in the past and the future. But I'd like to start by looking at the present. Yes. And if you can help us make some sense of this rather extraordinary moment in the Middle East. So on the one hand, we have uh, elections in Iraq. No matter what people think of that war, that is kind of an extraordinary development there. Saudi Arabia has had elections. They're, in my opinion, imperfect. Women did not participate, but at least they are elections. And of course, the Arabs and Israelis are once again in, in what looks like a dialogue. Against all that, on the other hand, we still have major human rights problems. I mean, you have paid the price. You have three years imprisonment. And unfortunately, in your own country of Egypt, we see this happening even as we speak. And you've just written about this. Yes. So what do we make of all of this? I mean, what does this mean about <coughs> chance for democracy? Is anything really happening, or are we just repeating the same old problems? No, there is something happening. And uh, as you summarized it, uh, there are enough happening to give activists like myself renewed hope that the future of the region is going to be better than the present. Uh, what we have uh, for some time is a deadly conflict between forces of liberalism, democracy, and freedom yeah. on one hand, and forces of liberalism, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, mm -hmm. fanaticism on the other hand. Right. And you see that playing in every country. Every country. And yeah. sometimes in every town, in every city. Mm -hmm. So the battle is on, mm -hmm. and we win some, we lose some. Mm -hmm. But so long as there is a fighting opportunity for liberals and Democrats like myself, mm -hmm. we will keep fighting. And yeah. we know that we have to pay a price, and right. we are willing to pay a price. Well, you've certainly shown you're willing to pay the price. You've paid the price, and you continue to do that. What you're telling me, if I understand you correctly, Saad, is this is a major intellectual battle as well. It's a battle for the hearts and minds of men and women. I mean, this is a Absolutely. battle of ideas. Yes. Yes, it is at the heart of it, it's bad as ideas. Everything yeah. starts as an idea. Right. Do you think this country, because you know, as you well know, we, the, the, the President's State of the Union address, the actions in Iraq, uh, the Arab Israeli uh, dialogue, and so forth, do you think this country and other outside countries are playing the role they should be playing in this battle of ideas? Because there's a lot of talk about promoting democracy. But as, for example, with the human rights issues in, in Egypt, is this country sufficiently active in? Commenting on that. No. The, oh. uh, what they say in their public uh, speeches is music to my ear, personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but action fails uh, short mm. of the promises, of the pledges, of the what could be done. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the answer to your question, yes, what they say mm -hmm. is great, mm -hmm. and we welcome it, and uh, we yet to see action that matches these words. And, and seeing that action that matches the words, and that, you know, is true of anything that people do, it must be proven by what they do, yes. or what they, their actions. That would involve this country, I guess this is a question to your side, it would it involve this country in speaking, as we say, truth to power, to, to some criticizing friends, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, sometimes speak, perhaps even a little uh, harshly to the nations with which this country is allied. Absolutely, and that's really the test of your commitment, is when you'll be able to speak truth to power, mm -hmm. no matter whether this power is back there or here, or on the right or on the left, or in the center for that mm -hmm. matter. But 
uh, that is what we expect from mature and developed democracies like yours. Mm -hmm. We need very, not only clear and loud messages, right. but clear and loud action. And I keep emphasizing and harping on this point right. because many of our leaders, despotic leaders in the Middle East, mm -hmm. probably in the third world generally, have learned the art of survival. And they know that uh, American administrations come and go every four years, every eight years at the most. And therefore, they take their time mm -hmm. and they gamble on or they bet on that yeah. the fact that, you know, George W. Bush may be enthusiastic about democracy now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in three years, somebody else will be here. There will be another set of priorities, another interest, another concern. Right. And that is what they're ga gambling on. I, you, I hear you loud and clear. They're gambling on that. And, and we Americans are famous for having short attention spans on some so, of these things. So, so I guess that's another calculation. Yes. One of the uh, most remarkable things you've written recently, uh, and I really want us to focus on it now, because uh, there's a tendency in our press today and a lot of comment to, to speak of the Middle East and democracy as though these are two uh, extraordinary, very different things that have to be brought together that never coexisted before. Mm -hmm. You have pointed out that there is a very rich history uh, lasting uh, almost 100 years of Arab liberalism. And I think it would be very good if you would just briefly describe what the main features of that were, when it happened, and, and, and how it came to be in the region. Well, I'm glad you asked this, because I'm always eager to speak about this liberal legacy in uh, Arab history. The whole thing started with the Napoleonic expedition to Egypt. 1798. In 1798, that's correct. Right. And that ushered modernization in the region. It didn't start immediately the liberal culture or the liberal, liberal ideas. Mm -hmm. It took probably another 50 to 60 years after the French expedition mm -hmm. before these ideas began to translate themselves into social movements and to demand democracy. Let me remind our viewer mm -hmm. that the first elected parliament in Egypt was in 1866. 1866. That was before Germany as a country came into being. That's right. That was before, four years before Italy got united and became a bona fide country in its own right. Mm -hmm. More or before many European countries became democratic, we in Egypt, as one country in Africa and in the Middle East, uh, was already on its way with a written constitution and with an elected parliament. Granted, it was not a Westminster mm -hmm. a type or a Jeffersonian democracy. Right. It was still, you know, a beginning democracy with a lot of mm -hmm. uh, ups and downs. But there was the seed of liberalism, both in ideas as well as in practice. You know, I think right now you've probably educated everyone watching, it, and me, myself as well, to something that very few people on this side of the Atlantic probably uh, have heard of or are familiar with. Let me ask you some questions, Zon and Saad. Sure. First of all, uh, the, 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 the French arrival and then the implantation of the idea and then its growth and so forth. Uh, do I take it that's the, basically the enlightenment ideal of yes. government? And so, so it's a very much like the same thing that's happened here. Sure. And sure. in France, of course, as well. And so yes. there's, there's a linkage, the European... The Absolutely. Uh, and I must say, because now, <clears throat> as I speak, mm -hmm. probably Iraq is on everybody's mind. Palestine is on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. So is Saudi Arabia. And you mentioned that in your introduction, mm -hmm. that in these three countries, some democratic process is underway. Right. Imperfect, as it may be, and we can talk about that later on. Mm -hmm. But... In all of these countries, as were in Egypt at the end of the 18th century, as in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and Morocco in the, uh, after the Second World War, there was always a foreign factor triggering uh -huh. or being a reinforcement of budding domestic mm -hmm. elements that were asking for better governance, accountable uh, rulers, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the inside and the outside usually converge at certain historical moments. L and what we're seeing in Iraq, right. in Saudi Arabia, in Palestine, 
are some of those moments. We are seeing those today. And, yes. and let's put that in the context, and that's very interesting <clears throat> to me. Let's contrast that with this Egypt you've just introduced us to in the middle of the 19th century mm -hmm. with a parliament functioning before Germany is even a country. Yes. Right? But at the same time, we have the British coming in now. Yes. Okay. Now, that's the colonial power in its day, obviously, that's taking control. What, did, what was their effect on the... Because here's, here's your outside power in the Egypt of that time. What did they do that, well, to advance or retract? And, no, they actually stunted uh -huh. this democratic experiment uh -huh. because they came in as a colonial power and they wanted to rule. And right. they ruled the country as uh, colonialists, as masters. Mm -hmm. And that set democracy back in Egypt for mm -hmm. another 50 years, 50 years, until 1919. Mm -hmm. The British came in 1882, mm -hmm. and it took us another 50 years, or thereabout, 1922, when we had mm -hmm. another constitution and another election mm -hmm. and another liberal age. So we had actually two liberal ages in interrupted our... Interrupted by colonialism. Interrupted by the British. The first one was at the end of the uh, second or the second half mm -hmm. of the 19th century. And the second liberal period in Egypt was from 1922 to 1952. 30 years in which mm -hmm. Egyptian democracy and liberalism flourished again. Now let's get the features of this liberalism, both uh, in the first instance, and that is the mid-19th uh, century, and in that... Uh, 30-year period from 22 to 52. Yes. Um, freedom of the press, institu civil society, what were, I mean, what kinds of things? These Just to were make the it, features. How did it work? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You had freedom of the press, right. uh, proliferating or uh, uh, mushrooming mm -hmm. of uh, newspapers and magazines, publication of books, translation, mm -hmm. very extensive a translation movement right. from uh, European writers uh, in all fields, from science mm -hmm. to fiction. And you have also art and theater. And that's very important mm -hmm. in the life of any liberalizing society, mm -hmm. is to have artistic and creative mm -hmm. expressions as part of the liberalization. Right. So we had a very thriving theater mm -hmm. uh, movement in Egypt in the late 19th century and throughout the first half of the uh, mm -hmm. 20th century. We also were probably the third or fourth country mm -hmm. to introduce motion picture. Really? In 1952, we were the third country in terms of after the United States and I think the UK and tied with Italy in terms of the number motion pictures, movies right, right. produced. So here you have, all of this was part of the same mm -hmm. era. Would, th would that extend, uh, because I mean, I, as a matter of fact, I've seen uh, examples of Egyptian cinema and they're very, very striking productions. Um, when, when this, this, this milieu that you, you describe, since democracy rests so much upon inclusiveness, what was the effect of it on things like women's rights, women's participation in all this, the mm -hmm. human rights expression of that era? Were any of these things as well advanced? Secularism, were, were these also features or factors or even burgeoning ideas within the... Uh, burgeoning ideas is the right expression, uh, both in the f first and the second liberal age, mm -hmm. you begin to see two things happening. One is a full-fledged inclusion of minorities mm -hmm. into the mainstream of political life, mm -hmm. gaining full rights of citizenship. We have a Coptic minority in Egypt, about 10%. Right. These are Christian Copts, mm -hmm. Christian Egyptians. <coughs> and we have women. And in, interestingly enough, the fortune of these two groups, mm -hmm. women and minorities, went up together or slided back down together. As in so many places. Yeah. Obviously, mm -hmm. it is, uh, seemed to be a law, a sociological law everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, both of them are suffering from the dictatorship in Egypt, and both of them are fighting to get back some of the gains that they once achieved. This is amazing. I mean, this is what we might call a once and future story. These things once existed, and they are also the hope for the future. Re reclaiming the past is really a key in what we're talking about. The obvious question side is what destroyed it? What made it end? What made all of this 
after 52? Well, we have two factors in our history. Mm -hmm. Either colonialism, mm -hmm. as we said, it set back the first liberal experiment, or authoritarianism. Mm. One is foreign, mm -hmm. the other one is domestic grown right. authoritarianism. Army, military, mm. <laughs> into power. And it is these two uh, that have stunted our political development and our cultural uh, do, do, I, do I sense then, are we talking about Gamal Abdul Nasser, the rise that of That was the beginning, yes. Mm -hmm. And Gamal Abdul Nasser is a very problematic and very mixed case because he started out fairly well. As a, he was as an army a, officer? An army officer, but with a progressive social agenda. Mm -hmm. Not equally progressive political agenda. Right. So he was for social justice. He effected uh, land reform for peasants who were landless. He introduced some very progressive socialist measures to benefit the middle class and the lower class and the working class. But then in the political area, he was a dictator who did not allow neither freedom of expression nor artistic creativity nor participation in democracy. Did he advance, <coughs> I, I'm trying to associate him with a notion, and I may be wrong, so correct me on this, a kind of a radical populism that the military would carry out so in a, in a so-called on behalf of the Egyptian people. Okay. George, you had it right on the knee. I, I got the idea right. You, you did, exactly. He was a populist leader. Mm -hmm. And populism is often in the third world has a market mm. and has an audience because most people are usually deprived, right, and right, poor, and so on. But then, after a point, even those who benefit from the early phase of populism mm -hmm. begin to realize that they could not live with bread alone. That's right. Yeah. That freedom is as important mm -hmm. or as valuable mm -hmm. as bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And that is always a hard formula mm -hmm. or equation in many societies, uh, you, and that is where we are. You're absolutely right. I've, I'm not, I'm for, I have not had the good fortune yet to visit Egypt, but I will. But I've been other okay. places, and I've seen, I've seen exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, there's, but let me ask you this question, Tussad. When, when things were going good, you know, when liberalism in both those two eras was functioning and flourishing, to what extent was it a, a class phenomenon? What I'm wondering is, was it the upper middle class and middle class that really were enthusiastic about it? Did they communicate it, even in those eras, to the less fortunate, the less favored? Or did the poor ever buy into the idea, as we would say? Well, that's a very good question, because what you have usually <coughs> is this, yes, usually it is the upper class and the middle class that get more than educated, mm -hmm. and they begin through that uh, modern education to value liberal freedoms mm -hmm. and to demand it, and they usually manage to get their way, as they did in two moments of our modern history, in the uh, later part of the 19th century, and then uh, after the second, the first world first war. world sorry. war. <laughs> and their successes is to open up the system mm -hmm. and to advance some social measures, which helps to empower mm -hmm. the lower and working classes, socially and economically. Mm -hmm. It is when those who are leading in the liberal age fail to empower the lower classes politically as much mm -hmm. as economically mm -hmm. that the lower class turns its back on liberal democracy and demands some leadership or demands some change to uh, get back into the system fully, not partially, but fully. And that's when populism begins to find a public mm -hmm. who is willing to support it. The obvious question, Saad, right now is how and to what extent can this be reclaimed? Can it be brought back and who can do it? Now, if liberalism, if, if there is going to be the kinds of things that you are working so hard to accomplish within Egypt, if that's going to come to pass, will it be the universities? Will it be the younger generation? Will it be the NGOs? This is a very powerful uh, non-governmental well, organization. Know, all so. of these three are key elements in rebuilding uh, mm -hmm. a new liberal age. Mm -hmm. These are building blocks that we need, the universities, as we're 
intellectuals and ideas are breeded and flourish. You NGOs who are with the grassroots in the field, mm -hmm. you have a new middle class that must espouse and endorse democracy and uh, get over the populist era that mm -hmm. uh, many of it or many of them grew up within or during in their childhood and maybe their youth. Like myself, I mean, I grew up uh, mid, you know, as a boy. This was Nasser's time, and I was one of those very enthusiastic about Nasser's populist agenda. Mm. Mm. Came from the countryside to the city, and I wanted the place. And he and his agenda and his program were very beneficial to me mm. and to people like myself, rural notable who are just moving to the city. Right. And then. <laughs> As soon as I got my education, I clashed with Nasser. <laughs> and I was banned from the country for eight years. That is when, you know, I was mm -hmm. doing my uh, right. edu high education or mm -hmm. graduate schooling here in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, this was in the 60s and we were right. beginning to reclaim, you know, freedom everywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. 68 in France, uh, same thing in Egypt, and so on. And we were here in the States as students, part of the student movement, civil rights movement, the anti-war uh, yes. movement, all of those uh, glorious moments in American history, as well as in world history. World history, indeed. Mm -hmm. So when we began to question our populist leaders, mm -hmm. some of them couldn't take it. And Nasser, unfortunately, as much as I loved him as a young mm -hmm. boy, a young man, Mm -hmm. I began to clash with him because, you know, I changed, he did not change. <laughs> I like that, yeah. He did not change. Right. And people around him did not change. And they didn't want things to change. Yes. So is that when repression really becomes exactly. a rule? Yeah, right. Uh -huh. And it's uh, harsher and harsher and harsher? It does, yes. When they lose their legitimacy, then they begin to use coercion to fill in the vacuum. This is like an iron rule of, of human misbehavior. Of oligarchy, yeah. yes. Um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me, Saad, is that the Egypt we are talking about and the Middle East we are talking about and the hope for liberalism and democracy that is, uh, thanks to people like yourself now being so brought back into the, into the mix, it's, it's also um, being put before what I understand to be legions of young men in particular without who are deprived, you know, there's an economic dimension here. Mm -hmm. There's a poverty, there's a hopelessness, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the, the West now has its concerns about terrorism and, and that kind of thing. But it seems to be related, clearly, to this sense of uh, despair, if you will. Is that correct? Among you? It is correct. And, again, if we say that uh, mm -hmm. you could not live by bread alone, mm -hmm. you could not live by freedom alone. Uh, These yeah. are twins that must go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And the uh, trick or the puzzle or the challenge is not to fall into the either or, or trade off one for the other. We argue, and our movement, and I'm part of a movement in Egypt and the Arab world, <coughs> is to say, yes, we can do both. And the only way to secure sustainable bread not just one time bread like populists will do, is to be part of governance, is to take the f your fate in your own hands. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you will be responsible and accountable for whatever happens to you. That is our message, right. to have the twin mm -hmm. demands going hand in hand. That's a message not just for Egyptians, uh, that you would also tell to Americans or anyone who would presume to help Egypt or be a partner uh, of Egypt. They have to pay attention to both things, right? Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Egypt and the rest, Africa and the Middle East, mm -hmm. Asia. Mm -hmm. This should be always in the minds of policymakers mm -hmm. in more established and wealthier countries like the United States. Do you, have a, do you have a sense right now, you know, elections are much in the news here in this country and many countries. We're clearly moving into a different political era as well as uh, moving into a, um, further into a new century that do you have a sense of, of for example, the Arab-Israeli issue right now, the Palestinian-Israeli issue in particular? Yes. That, first of all, do you see that as key, and do you see progress as possible or being made at this point? It is one of the keys. Mm -hmm. 
not the only key, but it is one of the keys. And it is an issue that has been, unfortunately, exploited mm -hmm. by uh, not only by rightful uh, people who were victimized in this conflict, both as Palestinians and Israelis, but mostly Palestinians, but also were cynically exploited by politicians. Mm. Leaders who wanted to ward off political reform mm -hmm. would always raise the question of Palestine as a priority. When cynically they do not, and they cannot do anything much about it, but they hold democracy hostage to solving the Palestinian question. And again, our message to them, even though we're rephrasing the earlier proposition, it should not be either or. You should not trade off liberation of Palestine or emancipation of Palestinians from occupation. You should not trade that off for democracy all over the Middle East. Right. What do the Syrians, the Moroccans, the Tunisians have to do with it? Why don't you start your democracy and give the Palestinians your solidarity and your support whenever you can? But there is no contradiction between fighting for the rights of the oppressed, who happen to be the Palestinians in this case, and the right of your own people for freedom and for participation in a sound and democratic governance. Once again, there is no either or. These are, right. these are parts of the whole. And that is really what we should always guard. Mm -hmm. We should not be dragged or slip into that trap right. which authoritarians use often. The either or. Yes. Saad Din Ibrahim, it is always an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, this conversation ends all too quickly for me, quite frankly, and for all watching. But you've already made some really extraordinary points in it. Well, thank you very much, George. I enjoy being with you. I enjoy being here at the Watson Center. We always learn when we are in your presence. Thank, thank you. you. Right. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wwic.si.edu. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. And thank you again, my dear. Good, friend. oh, my pleasure. Great. Right.